Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Hope uh, everybody's had a chance to get out and enjoy the sunshine today. Um, my name is Mark Singh. I am. <clears throat> I work with the Live Green Toronto team, which is a part of the City of Toronto's uh, Environment and Energy Division. And I'm really pleased to be your moderator this evening for what is our fourth uh, episode of the Live Green at Home workshop series. Um, we'll start by acknowledging that the land that we are meeting on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, sorry, and, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many fir diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that the that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, just before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'd like to note that this session is being recorded uh, so that uh, we can post this uh, on the on YouTube for for those who weren't able to join us today uh, to be able to uh, tune in and get all the information that Kristen is going to be passing on to us later on. Uh, we'll take questions at the end of the presentation, but we do encourage you as the presentation goes presentation goes on to type your questions into the Q&A box uh, and we will be sure to address them uh, at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. So now I'm uh, really pleased to introduce you to Kristen Burns, who is our speaker for the, the, the evening. Kristen has worked on the renewable energy team here at the Environment and Energy Division. Uh, since 2016. She has supported the installation of over 100 solar PV systems on city buildings. These installations support the leadership by example goals laid out in our ambitious climate action plan, Transform TO. More recently, Kristen has developed and manages the Solar TO program, which aims to encourage and support Toronto residents uh, through the process of installing sol solar panels. And that is what we're gonna hear about today. So I will hand it right over to Kristen. Thanks, Mark. I'm just going to get my screen sorted here. And there's the presentation. Perfect. You can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so my name is Kristen. Um, and this evening, I'm going to be talking to you about going solar in Toronto and our new-ish program that we're offering called Solar TO. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been with EED for about five years now, and during this time, our team's mandate has shifted from focusing exclusively on city-owned buildings um, to now working to increase the adoption of solar PV with the public. Um, and one of the main barriers that we've identified with the public is that people simply don't know where to start with solar. And since we have so much experience that we've gained doing it ourselves, we believe that this is somewhere that we can really help. Um, next slide, please, Mark. So just to give a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So first I'll give a brief overview of Transform TO, and then we'll move into uh, Solar 101, um, kind of how solar works, and then we'll go into kind of a guide to going solar, and then we will go through an example um, of some projects, and then lastly, uh, financing your solar project. Next slide. Um, so many of you are probably already familiar with Transform TO, so I won't spend too much time on it, but basically it's Toronto's climate action strategy that aims to achieve net zero emissions by the year 2050 while creating a low carbon future for Toronto that is healthy, equitable, and prosperous that benefits all. Next slide, please. So this is a breakdown of Toronto's current um, harmful emissions. And I like using this graphic because it kind of shows that even if we were perfect in the transportation and the waste sectors, that we would still have a lot of work to do in the building sector to be able to reach our goals. So this is where renewable comes in, renewables come in and um, Toronto home and building owners have the opportunity here to help us um, work to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by producing their own clean electricity with solar panels. Next. So these are some of the Transform TO long-term goals and um, the two that I want to point out to you today. Uh, the first one is, Mark, if you could just advance, I think there's, 
Yeah, 100% of existing buildings uh, in the city will be retrofitted by 2050, and 75% of energy um, in the city will come from renewable or low carbon sources by 2050. So these are kind of our team's main um, focus with Transform CO. Next slide. Um, so it wouldn't be fair for the city to ask the public to go solar without having done any of it ourselves. So for the past 10 years, we've been working on learning the process and we've installed over 100 solar PV systems on city owned buildings. The majority of these uh, solar PV systems were installed through the feed-in tariff program um, that started back in 2009. And with this program, the client or the home or building owner enters into a 20 year contract um, with a guaranteed fixed price for electricity that you generate. And it, this is a really good way to encourage the early renewable adopters. Um, the rates were really, really good per kilowatt hour of energy, which is just a unit of measure um, how energy is recorded. And um, unfortunately, this program was canceled uh, back in 2017 with the new government coming in. Um, but it was a really good program while it lasted and we got a lot of good um, solar on our city owned buildings. So our city owned buildings, or sorry, our solar PV systems on our city owned buildings range in size from three kilowatts, which is roughly the size of a semi detached Toronto home, um, all the way up to 500 kilowatts, which is the size of a large warehouse. And to give you an example of a mid range project, or Mid range solar projects, it would be like the size of a hockey arena, would be around 100 kilowatts. Um, so far, we have a total of nine megawatts capacity of solar in, um, on our city owned buildings, which is enough to, to sufficiently power over 1,100 homes in Toronto each year. And lastly, for this slide in 2017, our team won the CanSea. Solar Developer of the Year Award for um, having a really large portfolio of projects on a di diverse um, array of different um, city owned buildings. Next, please. Sorry for the quick trigger finger there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That was a long slide. <laughs> um, so this is just a map of all of the projects that we've done in the city of Toronto. And as you can see, they're, they're pretty evenly dispersed throughout the city. And they're mostly on community centers, arenas, libraries, and EMS, police, and fire stations. Next slide, please. So solar 101. Um, so looking at how solar panels work, basically what they do is they convert energy from the sun into electricity. And this electricity then goes through an inverter where it's converted into a usable form of electricity for your home. So um, if you understand anything about um, electrical engineering and stuff, the form of electricity that's used by your home is called AC power, um, where the electricity that's generated by the solar panels is DC. So it has to be fed through an inverter to convert it from DC to AC, since most homes and buildings use AC power. Um, so now that the feed in tariff program is over, there's a new way of connecting renewables to the grid and that's through the net metering program. Um, basically how this program works is that any electricity that is generated by your solar panels is first used by your home um, or building and then any excess electricity that you don't need is exported to the grid in return for a credit on your electricity bill. These credits are valid for 12 months and they can be used to offset the cost of electricity during the evening or in the winter months when the solar production is going to be much lower. Um, and lastly, just to add on this slide, when we're looking at installing solar, we always consider the south facing roof first because it receives the most amount of direct sunlight for the most amount of or for the most hours of the day. Um, and then we look at the west side, then the east, and we never put solar panels on the north side because they don't receive any direct sunlight and um, would therefore operate at a much lower efficiency. Next slide. So why should you consider solar? Um, firstly, 
to reduce your utility bill and protect yourself against rising electricity costs. So, um, you know, if, if electricity prices increase significantly, but you know that you have solar panels that will offset, say, 50% of your electricity consumption, you know that your electricity bill won't be going up by as much as everybody else's because you're always guaranteed to have that um, solar generation as kind of a buffer. Um, to reduce your GHG emissions and your carbon footprint, if that's something that um, is important to you, it's obvious, it's of course important to us um, here. So also to increase the value of your home, um, people are becoming a lot more aware and more conscious of renewable energy and it's something that they're looking for. So I think that it would definitely um, assist the retail value or the retail value of your home or building. Um, for businesses, it's a great marketing opportunity um, to be able to show that your customers that you're actively working to decrease your impact and to generate some of your own electricity for your operations. And then lastly, Toronto receives over 2,000 hours of bright sunshine every year. So why let that go to waste? Next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna get into kind of our guide to going solar. Um, and so for getting started, here are a couple of considerations that you might wanna start thinking about um, even prior to doing your research into solar. So does your roof get a good sun exposure? Um, this seems kind of like an obvious question, but I think that a lot of home and building owners don't really know what their roof looks like. So um, a good exercise that you can do for this is just to type in your address on Google and go on the satellite view, take a look at your roof. Um, are there any large mature trees around that are creating shading? Is there um, a skyscraper right beside your house and that might be creating some shade. So it's just a good idea to get oriented with your property. Um, next, is your roof coming up for replacement soon? So we wanna kind of be aware of what the condition of your roof is because the life of a typical shingled roof is typically anywhere from 12 to 25 years. And this kind of aligns with the life expectancy of solar panels, which is 20 plus. So um, the best time to install solar that we recommend is right after re-roofing because then you avoid any issues of potentially having to um, take the panels off shortly after installing them to re-roof or repair your roof and then um, put them back up. And although this is a possibility, we've had to do it for some of our um, systems, it's a possibility, but it will add to the overall cost of the system um, and therefore, you know, it'll extend your return on your investment. Um, and then lastly here, have you started by implementing any energy conservation measures? So the reason that we, we ask about this is because if you can work to actively decrease your home's electricity consumption, then you might not need as large of a solar system to be able to offset almost all of your um, electricity use. So we always recommend that you start with uh, energy efficiency upgrades if you haven't already. So system sizing. Um, we always wanna make sure that the system is sized based on the household or the facility's specific needs. Um, and I can explain a little bit more about this later. Um, so just to give you an idea, the average home consumes about 25 kilowatt hours a day. Um, that's around uh, 9,100 kilowatt hours a year. And um, We'll just remember that number for later on when I when I go through an example um, for you guys. And um, a typical solar PV system is can it, for a residential home is anywhere from three to ten kilowatts. And um, we want to be careful about oversizing the solar system uh, just to ensure that you're not giving away free electricity to Toronto Hydro. So. Um, because before I had mentioned that the credits that you generate are only valid for 12 months, um, if you don't use up all of those credits in a 12 month period, then they just go away. So 
in order to make sure that you're getting the most for your money, we want to size it um, pretty close to how much electricity your home consumes um, so that you aren't paying more money up front for a larger system that you don't even really need. Um, so when we do our solar assessment, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well, um, we typically aim to, to offset around 30 to 80% of your electricity consumption if possible. Next slide, please. Okay, so budgeting. Um, I think what's also important to remember with doing solar is this is your project and you, you may go to a solar installer and they're probably gonna try to um, show you the largest system that you can do possible um, because you know that's their job. But I think that if you only have budget for say a three kilowatt um, solar PV system that's around $9,000, then that's fine. Even if you have room for 10 kilowatts, um, which would be around $25,000 you can kind of pick and choose to meet your budget and your goals. Um, yeah, and then another thing here is to hire a reputable solar contractor, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then another point here is to um, monitor your system performance. So a lot of solar installers will add this on um, in, their, in their scope of work, um, and it will give you the ability to monitor your system in real time, just to make sure that um, there are no problems with the system. So you can ensure that it's generating how it's supposed to based on um, the system size and um, the projection, projections that the installer has given you. Next slide, please. Okay, so what to look for in a solar contractor. Um, so they should offer you a preliminary design proposal um, that has projected system performance reporting, um, and you'll get a better idea of what that might look like in a second when I take you through an example. Um, in their report or their um, proposal, they should do an electricity bill analysis here. Um, so they should be asking you for some type of electricity consumption information just because how I mentioned that we want to make sure that the system is sized appropriately for your needs. Um, we don't want them to be showing you a system that produces double what you need, um, knowing that that would be wasting money for you. Um, so they should be asking for that. They should give you a pricing quote. Um, even better if that pricing quote has a, um, a detailed cost breakdown. Sometimes they don't, they don't um, give this right off the bat, but I think it's definitely a good thing to ask for as they should be able to provide that because they know what kind of equipment they're quoting um, and they know the, the different fees associated with connecting solar in Toronto. Um, they should deal with the Toronto building permit for you. Um, part of that Toronto building permit is a structural review by a, um, a structural engineer, and that's to ensure that your roof has the capacity to take on the additional load of solar panels. Um, they should also liaise with Toronto Hydro to get approval to connect and then to connect the system to the electricity grid once um, installation has completed. And then lastly, they should arrange for the electrical safety authority inspection. Um, this is something that needs to happen before the system can be turned on. Next slide, please. Um, so this is solar TO. Um, so basically this is the new program that we have come up with that we, um, that we think can really help homeowners get over that first step. Um, so we provide a no cost consultation for residents and building owners or businesses who are interested in installing solar in Toronto. Our assessment will include an online visual check to determine solar opportunity for your property. And in this, we will do a conceptual layout and system sizing 
shading report. So this takes into account any large trees or buildings in the area. Um, high level budgetary estimates to give you an idea of what the costs might be. And we offer ongoing advice and support as you go through the process to kind of give you an unbiased um, opinion, because I know that sometimes when you're contracting out an installer, it can be kind of, I don't know, it, it, it'll just be reassuring to have an unbiased opinion from the city um, if you so choose. So to request the assessment, just send an email to solarto at toronto.ca with your address um, and we will get started um, working on the assessment to help you out. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna take you through an example of what we will provide. Um, so here you can see, this is just like the report that is generated by the software that we use. It's called Helioscope. It uses satellite imaging um, to do the solar assessment. So just looking here, um, this, this system is a 4.6 kilowatt system um, and at the annual production number here, so this system would generate around 5,800 kilowatt hours per year. Um, and then down here in the monthly production graph, you can see um, the difference between uh, solar generation in the middle of winter when there's not much sunlight, the amount of sunlight hours is much smaller, um, and then all the way up into the summer when you have your peak production month. So with the net metering program, if you are generating in excess during um, May, June, July, August, then those credits will carry forward to then help you out in um, December and January. Next slide. So this is the layout itself, um, and there's a lot of cool elements in here. So basically when we do it this way with the satellite imaging, it lets us add in trees. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see the, um, the shade report and it, it shows you how the shading from these obstructions um, are impacting the solar panels themselves. Um, and we also have a lot of different roof angles here. So this is pretty typical of homes in Toronto where you've got one section that sloped over here and we can only fit one panel. And then this section over here, we've got a couple panels in a portrait orientation. Um, and then we've got a flat roof section with um, ballasted panels. So they're basically just weighted down um, on the roof with concrete blocks. And then that little orange square over there is a rooftop patio, so we don't wanna put any panels there. Um, and then you've got another two over here. So it's, it's pretty customized um, and we can give you a really good idea of how much solar you can actually fit on your roof before you go um, out and ask a solar installer um, for a quote. Next, please. And I just realized that since Mark's doing the slides for me, I was I was circling all the sections, but it wasn't doing anything. Oh well. Um, so yeah, here's the shade report, and you can see um, the shading that these trees are casting on the roof. So it's not really having much of an impact, except on section four. You can see that that panel is a little bit more shaded. Um, and then in section one, there's a panel near the back that's orange. So that panel is probably getting a little bit of shade from the chimney that's to the right. Uh, and that's why the efficiency of that specific module will be a little bit less. Um, and then on section three, there's a red one there. And um, that's probably getting a little bit of shade from that patio. Um, I think it was an elevated, like it had a railing or something. Um, but yeah, it gives you a really good idea of whether solar is something that is even worth 
worth um, considering for you because there definitely are some neighborhoods in the city that the tree canopy is so dense or um, there's so many tall buildings around that solar really just wouldn't be best suited for that location. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here, here's an idea of the business case information that we will provide for your property, um, along with the reports that I just showed you. So um, these preliminary estimates are based on um, different quotes that we've seen from residents, um, our own experience with solar from installers, um, and also just the industry, like what the pricing is looking like. So for this project, this 4.6 kilowatt project, it's about 14 to 16,000, um, generating over 5,700 kilowatt hours a year. So if we look back to that number I gave you of, um, I think it was 9,125, which would be kind of like the average um, consumption from a Toronto home. So this is this is would offset a pretty good chunk of that. Um, so the estimated bill savings in this case were around $900 a year. So these savings are generated um, by taking the amount of electricity that the solar is projected to produce and um, multiplying it by that assumed time of use rate of 0.156. Um, per kilowatt hour, um, and then you get your savings of 900, and that $900 a year will go to offset, um, or it will go to pay back the capital cost. And in this case, that capital cost will be paid off in 13 to 14 years um, without any additional incentives. There aren't any incentives for solar right now in Toronto. Um, or provincially or federally, but we're hoping to see some stuff come out um, in the future with the federal budget process. Um, so we're hopeful about that, but that would really help a lot. Um, yeah, so th in this particular case, this home um, electricity usage was over 16,000 kilowatt hours a year, and that's very high for a Toronto home. Um, and so this 4.6 kilowatt system would only offset 34% of their annual consumption. Um, so we recommended that they, um, they look to do some energy efficiency upgrades and decrease their consumption before they look to, um, to do solar. And we recommended the Home Energy Loan Program for financing, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. Next slide. Okay, so energy storage. Um, should you consider energy storage? The main reason that um, energy storage is typically added to solar PV is as a res resiliency measure. Um, so it will give you backup power in the case of a prolonged grid outage. Um, the technology, however, is still pretty expensive at the moment. So it doesn't have a good payback like solar does. It, it won't pay itself off during the life of the asset, but um, if resiliency is your goal, then battery storage is a great thing to consider. Um, so battery storage, it, it stores energy um, generated by the solar panels that you can use um, either during peak hours or um, like I mentioned, in the case of a grid outage, you can also charge the battery at night when electricity is cheaper, and then um, you can use that electricity during the day, um, during the peak times to um, decrease your cost there. Next slide. Um, so this is one of the EMS stations that we've piloted this technology at. Um, we installed solar and energy storage in order to increase the resiliency of this critical service building. And the system allows us to island the building from the grid and draw that stored energy from the batteries while continuing to generate solar pretty much indefinitely if the sun is out. Um, the station was a really good case study for us because it's approximately the size of an average house, 
but it has double the um, electricity consumption. So, so we used um, two Tesla Powerwall batteries and um, it was around a 10 kilowatt system. Um, next slide, please. I think I have some specs. Yeah. So um, the solar in total is about 10 kilowatts and we have some on the rooftop and some on the south facing wall. We use two Tesla Powerwall batteries to get 27 kilowatt hours of stored energy. And um, that's, that's pretty much enough to power all of the building's critical loads pretty much indefinitely as long as um, we're getting some solar activity. So the site's consumption is about 26,000 kilowatt hours, which is pretty high, it's double a house. Um, and yeah, this system offsets 39% of the site's consumption and the capital cost was around $80,000. But um, when we do our city projects, it's typically more expensive because we have um, full union labor requirements and um, it, they can just get a little bit more complicated than if you were doing it on your own. Um, next. There's just some more pictures of the site. Looks pretty cool. Um, Mayor Tory came to the site um, a couple of years ago when we had just um, turned it on and um, he was really keen on the technology, um, told us that we should do this at, at all of the um, critical service buildings in the city and then continue on. And um, we've, we've started, I think we've actually just turned it on. We a community center one, so a larger scale solar PV and energy storage system. So hopefully more news and case studies to come from that. Um, but it's definitely been a great technology so far and totally recommend it if you can fit it into your budget um, and into your project goals. Next. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Um, so lastly, for financing, um, the city has two loan programs. Um, one, the home energy loan program, so that's offered to residents, homeowners, um, and it provides low interest loans to homeowners that are interested in undertaking energy efficiency, water conservation, and renewable energy work. So this includes solar PV, energy storage, um, heat pumps, there's a whole list. So you could check out their, um, their website and um, look at the eligibility, eligibility requirements. Um, and then we have the energy retrofit loan on the commercial and business side. And it's basically the same thing, offers low interest loans to help building owners improve their energy efficiency. Next. Okay, that's all for me. Um, and we'll take questions now. That's our, that's our email address there. Um, you could also find our um, website. I think if you just type in SolarTO Toronto, it'll pop up for you. Um, and you can find out more info there and um, feel free to shoot us an email and request your solar assessment. We'd be happy to help you out. Um, it, I mean, depending on how many people are interested tonight, um, it might take us a little bit to get back to your request. Um, there's only a couple of us working on it and um, we're doing each one manually at the moment. Um, we're currently working on developing a GIS based solar map that will let you type in your address and generate pretty much all of this information um, immediately instead of having, having staff um, take, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes on each one, but yeah. That's all for me. My face is really red. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, for those who are interested in that EMS 46, the paramedic station uh, project, Kristen wrote a great article that's on the Live Green Toronto blog. So if you just go to livegreentoronto.ca slash blog, you can search EMS 46 and you'll find the article with a lot more details um, on, on that uh, on that project. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
let's get into some questions. Hey, Christian, I wanted to ask you a question about the shading mm -hmm. um, slide. So it was super interesting to see that technology. It looked to me like like the big tree was actually shading the whole project, though. Like how, like just based yeah. not knowing how the 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 report works, right? Right. So that maybe would have been more significant if the tree was directly south and was closer. But I think that you can't really see it in the report. But the house was actually pretty tall in comparison to the tree. Uh, so it, it's a lot easier to see it in the actual program when you have all the different heights. Um, but I, I look at Google Maps, I go on Street View to try to suss out how tall the tree is and, you know, um, but yeah, the program completely takes all of that into account and it's actually really cool um, how fast it can give you that information and tell you whether, whether it's going to be worth it to do solar at that particular property. And that, that factor, factors into our business case too. So if a project is completely shaded, um, the payback period for the project is going to be like 20 plus years. So you can still do solar. It's just not going to be as good as a site that was completely full sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. So we have a number of questions. So let's uh, let's tackle them one at a time. The first mm -hmm. one <clears throat> is, should PV systems at home be reported to home insurance? If so, will they increase the cost of the insurance? Yeah, that's a good question. I know I've gotten that question before, and I don't think this is this is based on like people on my team asking their insurance providers, um, and I don't think it makes a difference on your insurance. Um, the way that solar is connected is pretty safe, um, and in the case of a grid outage or a grid emergency, the solar system will turn itself off in order to protect the Toronto Hydro staff. Um, so if they're working on the grid, there's no risk to um, the staff or to your home. Um, if you added battery storage, that's when um, you would be able to continue to access your solar um, production potential with a, grid out with a grid outage, but that has some extra um, electrical components in there to um, ensure that it's safe um, in that case. Mm -hmm. So. To answer that question, I guess um, it would talk to your insurance your agent, <laughs> insurance provider. Um, they would be able to give you more details, um, as well as I think that the solar installer themselves would have more info on that. Um, but I don't think for our city projects, it's ever affected insurance. Uh, thank you. So Brandon asks. Are loans currently available for customers? I think uh, I'm not sure who he would be referring to as customers, um, customers of whom. Um, and are installations done exclusively by you or is it contracted? Yeah, we we don't do the installations. Um, when we've done uh, solar with the city, we always contract out to a solar installer. We We don't do the installation ourselves, but we are kind of more from the perspective as a um, building owner, as the client. So um, you would find a solar installer to um, do the work for you. And if you needed support through that, um, choosing an installer, we'd be happy to review quotes with you. We can't recommend any particular installer just due to liability, um, but we can kind of look it over and point you in the right direction to make sure that you know there aren't any significant discrepancies in the proposal that they're showing you right so to be very clear that we are the city of toronto so we're not doing any installations yeah. we're not doing any work in your home we're just providing you with information and connecting you with resources to help you decide whether solar makes sense for your home mm -hmm. right and our um, consultation and our assessment is done completely online. Nobody will be coming to your house. Um, it's just based on the satellite images that are there. Um, or if you're doing any kind of major renovations or a new build, we can look at the drawings and do the design based on the drawings. Uh, thank you. So the next question is on existing on the existing solar panels, did you measure 
I'm not a science person, so this question does not make very much sense to me, but perhaps it will to Kristen. Um, on the solar existing solar panels, did you measure the electromagnetic field extent and parameters? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure about that question. Um, I can take that back and ask one of my electrical engineers on my team, but like Mark, I'm not, uh, well, a science maybe, but, but not so much on the nitty gritty of the electrician side. Um, so I can take right. that back. Um, that's a good question though. I, I've not gotten that question before. So if you could save that and maybe send it to me and follow Will up do. on that. From Alex, how often do you need to clean solar panels? Mm -hmm. um, so solar panels are actually a really low maintenance technology once they're installed. Um, in terms of cleaning, it's really just based on personal preference, I guess. So on our city owned solar um, arrays, we don't really do any kind of cleaning on them. We have opted to do um, not annual maintenance, like every couple of years, we'll, we'll have a solar company go and just check on the system to make sure that they're performing okay. Um, but we have 100 systems to keep track of. So. If it's on your own, um, you'll have a better idea of, um, you'll be able to monitor the system performance a lot more closely. Um, and if you would like, you could have um, annual maintenance done by a solar installer. Um, if you have safe access to your roof, or if you have, um, you could do like a really long broom squeegee type of thing. If you can I was just thinking the same, those the people ground. with the rooftop deck, you know, with a really yeah. long squeegee can mm -hmm. <laughs> get her done. Yeah. Um, in terms of like snow removal, some people ask about that too. So we personally don't remove snow off of our panels um, because that would take much longer than it would be worth, like then than we would actually generate. Um, so, on your own home, like again, you could get like a broom or something like that, but typically the panels, um, they generate heat themselves. And after a large winter storm, we typically see that um, the following days are full of sunshine. So the snow melts pretty quickly and um, it's not a big deal that way. Great, thank you. Okay, from Monica, does the utility bill savings component include both electricity that is used by the occupants and electricity that is sold back to the grid via net metering, or is it only the former that is electricity used by the occupants? Um, so the way that with net metering, um, you're, you're typically probably only, only going to see um, bill credits during the summer months when um, your production far exceeds your home's consumption. Um, so that credit that is generated, um, you could have a bill that's $0 in like July. Your bill could be $0 and you could also carry forward money into the next month that will be used to offset the cost there um, but maybe I'm just not really understanding the question. I'm not sure if that. If so that I think answered. on the, I think on the bill, is there a, a like a state on the statement? Is there um, a section called a line called utility bill savings, or is that? Um... Uh, no, no, no. Um, so the way that it shows up, um, it'll just be in the right corner where it says how much you've paid. It'll say credit like CR, uh, and then it shows the amount that you're carrying forward to the next month, and then it'll show that your bill was $0 type of thing. Um, okay. We're still kind of trying to figure out the net metering billing, because we only have um, one net metered site, and that's that EMS station that we showed you. So we're learning a lot from there. Um, and because the solar PV systems in Canada for the last 10 years have all been the feed-in tariff program. It's a very different billing process, so we're still kind of trying to figure that out. Um, but if I remember correctly, you said Toronto Hydro is the the the, um, the organization or the entity that the the 
energy is sold to, right? So mm -hmm. if if this person, if Monica has further questions about this, could they could probably speak to Toronto Hydro to get details, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks. Um, and Monica, yes, the software that 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 is used is Hel oh Helioscope. They're, she's wondering if it's proprietary or can people use it to conduct their conduct their own assessments? Uh, yeah, um, you have to pay for it. We have a membership. I know that you can do um, like a free one one month trial, and um, Helioscope has a lot of good training um, webinars that you can take. But we we do pay for it, and I think that it's about a thousand dollars a year. Or something like that, um, and this is something that we we subscribe to even before we started offering assessments to the public. We would just use them for our own use to um, kind of use it as a first step to assessing our city-owned buildings to see which ones looked the best, and then based on that, we would go and look at the roof age and um, a bunch of other factors to see which ones were the best for solar. Okay. Uh, so we have another question. Has there been any issues with vandalism on city solar panels? Um, I, I don't think that we've had any issues, um, mostly because they're all on the roof, like the solar panels are on the roof. So you can't really see them from the ground. Um, and in on sites where we, where roof access is kind of easy for like teenagers that just want to go up and hang out on the roof. Um, we've taken different measures to be able to mitigate that, to make it harder for um, people to get up on the roof. But I, I really don't think that we've had any issues with that on our city facilities at least. The other thing being the city facilities generally have some level of security, so um, a little bit of a different context than um, than a right. home, right? Mm -hmm. um, it'd be interesting, uh, just as a as an aside for those of you who are in the audience, it'd be interesting to just see whether you are here uh, and interested in solar for residential purposes or for business purposes. So maybe you just type that into the chat box so we can get a sense. Mm -hmm. um, that would be help helpful to know. Uh, mm -hmm. Question from Carlos: If I am running PV off grid, do I need a permit from the city? Well, I guess the city wouldn't really know. Um, well, <laughs> don't say <laughs> that. Running, no. <laughs> I'm I'm not. Um, do you mean in terms of the building permit? Yeah, or, you don't need a permit um, for the panel. You we, you need a building permit, right? So. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So it would be a building permit that you need, um, and that's for installing the solar panels on the roof. Whereas the Toronto Hydro side, you wouldn't have to do if you were going off grid. Um, so yeah, I would definitely still do a building permit because, like I mentioned, within that building permit, that requires a structural review, and um, you really want to make sure that you have that before installing solar on your roof, um, not only because of the um, the extra weight, but if the panels are um, mounted in a way that's kind of like sloped, then there's also the issue of wind loads. So, um, you know, the wind, if it comes in a certain direction, it could pick up the panels and you really want to make sure that um, you you have those, those checks and balances in place. Um, but for off-grid Toronto Hydro, you wouldn't need to um, to interact with them because it wouldn't be tying back into the grid at all. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Anais: What are the maintenance maintenance costs? I think we've already kind of addressed that one. Um, mm -hmm. That we don't we don't really do a ton of maintenance, and of course the situation is slightly different if uh, it's a residential. Uh, Installation versus commercial or business, right? Yeah. But what about so? Cost. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, because you mentioned like every yeah. couple of years we get a company like contractor to come out and kind of just check in on the system. Like, do you have some, yeah. some estimates on that front? I'm not sure if our estimates would really add value because Apply, we would yeah. do it as part of a huge portfolio. Um, but 
it's something that you could ask a solar installer about, um, and you'd probably really just be paying for their time. So I don't know if if you could compare it to like getting your your eaves trough cleaned or something like that, or um, you know just having having an electrician come to your house mm -hmm. and make sure everything's all in order. Um, so not relatively really sure relatively minimal, right? Yeah. Over the, yeah. Over yeah. Time, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, Mehdi asked whether, and you addressed this already, but whether the city has an approved vendor list, and you mentioned we don't, we don't right. offer so a vendor list. We're working on putting together a list of installers that are servicing the GTA, so we've already um, reached out to a bunch of installers that we know of. They've completed a survey and we're just working on putting this list together it would be kind of like a directory um but that doesn't vet the contractors in any way it's more just a way to um point homeowners and building owners somewhere so that they have like a, a first step um at looking who to contact but um once you identify a couple companies we recommend that you ask them for a quote um kind of do a comparison to um, see see what people are offering, and um, like I said, if you need some support with that, we can review the quotes with you, um, just to kind of give you our opinion and um, help you make your own decision on that. I think that's an, an important distinction because I, I I think some of our our attendees might think that we are um, there. There clearly is a little bit of confusion that that we might be a contractor. Um, and mm -hmm. to reiterate, we are not, right? We are your local government mm -hmm. or your city of Toronto government, and we're here to look out for you. So, you know, what, what Solar TO is offering is um, kind of like that second opinion almost, um, or first opinion if we're the first people you go to. Um, yeah, so just wanted to clarify that. Uh, another question is, can you install a panel on a detached garage roof as well as on the house? Yeah, you can. Um, when people are looking at their garage for solar, um, one of the important considerations is, does your garage already have electricity run to it? Um, and the reason that this is something that I would encourage you to consider is because if you don't, then, um, there, the, the solar installer might have to do trenching from your garage to um, your home in order to connect it to the um, main electricity panel. Um, and that's in the case of if you were looking to connect your solar to the grid, um, if you were looking at buying a couple of panels from Home Depot and just kind of um, putting them up there yourself to have it power your, um, your needs for inside the garage, then that would be a different story. Um, but it's still kind of the same process, installing it on your garage versus your home if you want to go through the net metering program. Um, and we always recommend looking at the, the house roof first, um, just because it's a lot easier if there's not already um, an electricity connection there. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so question from Dave, uh, is the city looking into or considering community solar options, which is especially beneficial for residential projects? Yeah, um, community solar is something that we've been interested for in for a really long time. Um, and the main constraint here is that virtual net metering or community solar is not allowed under the current regulations. Um, so our team has commented on um, amending these regulations. They're looking at doing a virtual net metering pilot project um, that will hopefully turn into a new regulation that will allow us to do that. Um, but right now in, um, in Ontario, it's not allowed. So the only option we have is net metering, unfortunately. So hopefully, coming up because I agree community solar um, would be amazing, especially in the case where your house is completely shaded, but your neighbor has lots of space and you want to kind of share and both be able to benefit. Um, but 
that's not allowed yet. Thank you. So there's still quite a few questions and we are running out of time. So I do apologize yeah. to those uh, those who we do not have. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we aren't able to get to your questions. Let me see if I can choose a couple of questions that uh, we have not touched on before. Um, one interesting one is, do you think the cost of installing solar panels will decrease over time? Yeah, um, so the cost of installing solar has been steadily decreasing um, for, you know, for forever. Um, so the cost is definitely coming down quickly and the efficiency of the panels are increasing at the same time. So yes, um, definitely I do think so that it will continue to come down. And that's one of the reasons that it's, it's become so much more um, accessible for, for people is the cost has come down so much. Great, thank you. Um... This is an interesting one. How does the installation of a PV system affect the value of a home? Yeah, I guess this is this is this response is kind of just my own opinion. Like if I was looking at a home and it already had solar, I would definitely be super excited about that. I think that it would add to the value of a home um, personally, but then you might have people who are on the other end of the spectrum and they don't want it. But I think um, generally people are um, are becoming more in tune with renewables and really wanting to participate in generating their own electricity. Um, that's just my opinion though. Maybe ask your real estate agent, I don't know, <laughs> anybody in real estate. Mm -hmm. Um, and the last question, uh, is there any software for monitoring the system after the installation to understand everyday generation? Yeah, um, so I think the, the software that is on most of our solar uh, PV systems is called SolarView. Um, and basically what it does is it gives us real time information. We can see how much um, electricity we've generated on the day. Um, in the whole life of the system, we can see, um, you know, pretty much everything, how much money it's generated for us, how much savings and stuff like that. So I know that on a lot of the quotes that I've seen from solar installers, they do offer um, system monitoring. So um, they're probably all pretty much the same. They give you those couple of basic um, output and it, it shows you how the system's doing. So. Awesome. Um, so that's, I think it, we're, we are out of time. Um, uh, just a few things. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was really awesome. Um, and uh, thank you to our audience for, uh, for your contributions and for the many, many questions. I apologize again that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, perhaps what we can do is we can um, uh, do a Q and A that is attached to this presentation somehow. I'll let Jessica figure that out. Um, I'm not making promises on her behalf. Uh, I will mention as well that uh, if you are interested, uh, you know, this 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 presentation, this webinar was obviously uh, chock full of information. So um, a reminder that this will be recorded and added to the Live Green Toronto YouTube channel at some point in the future. Uh, so you'll be able to go back to it and, and see the slides and such. And uh, if you have any questions, look up the Solar TO program uh, on the City of Toronto website. So that's toronto.ca and just search Solar TO um, or go to livegreentoronto.ca, all one word, um, and you'll get all the information you need. You need. So I hope that, uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, virtu virtual round of applause, digital round of applause for Kristen. Thank you so much for the, the information. I hope you are all inspired, uh, hopefully, to uh, think about adding solar to your homes or to your businesses. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.